doing um, pulling together my materials, I realized I've already done this talk to you. I, I showed this to you uh, March 23rd, 2021. I see. See, but we ran out of time and I was like trying to show you too much and you don't really care about all the GIS details. Yeah, I got um, a little, yes, it was a little over. It was like, it was really overwhelming and yeah. I got a lot of good feedback, mm -hmm. but um, Anyway, sadly, since March 2021, little has changed, except that we're all 20 months older and closer to losing our ability to drive automobiles. And in fact, this intersection got worse because Manhattan Beach widened it one lane to give a right turn lane so that the people making a right turn can go faster and hit pedestrians at a higher speed. So to reiterate, I did all this for my GIS class for UC San Diego Extension, and I had to like show that I was doing all sorts of fancy GIS stuff that you don't care about. That's fine. And um, but I wanted to start with a starting point that we we as community beach cities um, through the COG and through Beach Cities Health District, we profess to believe all these great things like who's not against thriving seniors who's not against kids walking to school but then we make these you know then we blah 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 we um we uh somebody says i want to park in front of my house you don't take away my parking space or you're going to slow down traffic and all those uh, idling cars blah 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 and nothing changes and in fact cars just big get bigger and we just keep widening roads and we let squeaky wheels host, you know, hostile to changes in uh, like in their little micro area that they're concerned about. Veto the changes that we need to have like a workable network. Um, and I call those, yeah, you know, I call those status quo enthusiasts, except that it's not the status quo. Like as a climate scientist, I've been listening to people say no, 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 no for the 30 years. But that, um, the climate didn't care that they're a status quo enthusiast. The climate kept changing because if we do nothing, we're making a decision and we're making a decision to make things worse. Mm -hmm. And if we let everybody veto changes, then it's not a network unless it's all connected. We can't let people veto stuff. And that we can we can lobby your city council saying we you know we we have we have community input and we listen. And we try to mitigate it for the people in the local area, but we do not allow them to say no and veto it. Like last night in Torrance, they just vetoed a bike lane that would connect um, a, um, a high school. <laughs> anyway, um, that was a, so anyway, I went through detailed, um, I went a detailed analysis. This is my study area. I put in places where our designated senior housing and I, or designated senior, um, senior uh, community centers or exercise uh, places that do senior exercise plans. So those are the places that a senior, you know, those are nodes that a senior needs to visit, right? And I really did it very intensively for North Redondo Beach, like from 190th all the way to Marine. Um, I looked at the schools and I looked at the se uh, senior staff and I, and um, I use lots of geographic tools, spending lots of time. I did a literature review to see best practices um, of both what happened, what was done around the world and what was done in the US. And I mainly focus on best practices in the US because we're under US law. So these are the things that we can do practically in our country. But um, anyway, we didn't choose to do it. Although Denver is doing really great. And so we might move back to Colorado. Um, but you know, last time I inundated you with too much stuff. So I decided to number the things that I want you to remember and write down in your notes. Number one, safe streets are a feminist issue. Yeah, you know, California DMV um, tells people above a certain age that um, in order to renew your driver's license, you have to come in and come in for additional testing. And they find that with very little resist, um, that women don't need very much to just turn in their driver's license. They come in and they get a California ID instead of try to renew their dri driver's license. Older men will try over and over and over again until they um, get their driver's license renewed. So um, women on average, um, give up their driver's license at a much earlier age than men. We also live longer than men. And in California, women spend twice as long without access to cars as men. 
And we shouldn't have to like cower at home because we've got no one to drive us. And we, or because we're scared to walk on the street or there's nothing walkable. You know, car dependency robs us of our independence, our friendships, our spontaneity, just our whole enjoyment of life. And it doesn't have to be that way. So we're a feminist, we're a progressive feminist organization, and we really need to take up safe streets, or at least I'm lobbying you to take it. This is why I care so much about it, because um, on top of being a climate scientist, I want to move around with complete freedom, even when I stop driving. And so these are my GIS methods. And um, this is what's called a travel shed within a 20 minute time window. And this is highly idealized. We know traffic isn't um, as good as um, the Esri software says it is. But you know, we all rightfully fear our loss of the ability to drive because the, um, the, gray, uh, the gray circles are how far we can travel in a five, 10, 15, 20 minute drive shed versus, and then um, it, and then in the inside those egg yolk things, those are our 20 minute walk sheds. If you were driving at a normal adult pace, which seniors don't, seniors walk about two thirds as fast as the pace that is assumed here. So that 20 minute walk shed is really a 30 minute walk shed for seniors. And this is our collective nightmare. This is, um, this is what we don't want to be. We don't want to be a statistic. We don't want to be the victim. We don't want to be the perpetrator. We want a way to live a full socially integrated life without needing to be in a car. And we, when we leave our house, we want to be sure that we can get home alive. Um, the solution is not to sit alone at home all the time fearful. The solution is not to risk other people in your community. The solution is for our community to give us a means for car-free, independent living. So Andrew Bowen is a journalist in um, San Diego, and he noticed a pattern with these police reports. So she, he started a whole Twitter thread of these, um, what we call traffic violence, because these are not accidents. These are results. These results are because of the design of our streets. But over and over and over again, seniors are either the perpetrators or the victims of traffic violence. And it doesn't have to be that way. Vision Zero actually works in other, there are countries that have not had a single person killed on the streets in years, in or outside of vehicles. Um, in New York, New Jersey, and Jersey City, and Union, um, Union City, New Jersey went all in on Vision Zero. And they have either zero or one person killed on the streets. It, um, in and outside of cars for multiple years. I mean, since they start really, you know, we can do this, we choose not to do this. Anyway, so these are the idealized walk sheds that I use Breakwater Village um, and uh, the Montecito and Heritage Point. These are all senior apartments. Heritage Point is run by the um, Redondo Beach Housing Authority. Montecito and Breakwater Village are um, private private condos that are, you know, from our inclusionary zoning. Um, but, and then these are places where se the senior center or Mira Costa pool where they do the senior aqua aerobics, the Hermosa Beach Senior Center. Anyway, these are places that seniors want to get to. And ideally, you know, it looks like on paper that they can get there, but they really can't because even though on paper, um, our sidewalk network is complete. It's actually not accessible if you're in a roller, if you're in a wheelchair or you're using a walker. It's, um, uh, you have to like walk out in the middle of the street here in or, um, because there's just no space. Or what if you're at this intersection, it's super wide and you can't cross it in a single light cycle. You know, what you get is if you cannot cross, if you cannot cross at Aviation and Artesia, which is here in the bottom right, then your walk shed is just missing a whole, a whole quadrant. And a senior at Montecito will no longer be able to attend aqua aerobics at Miracosta, which just starts a whole chain of other um, like health degradation, social deterioration, because they're not able to meet their friends for exercise class and coffee afterwards. Um, but that, that was a choice that we made. You know, people, including me, went and said, don't widen this. In fact, you should be putting in pedestrian islands or traffic coming. And we got nowhere. They just went ahead and they widened it. 
And so the route finding challenges mean that you have to, uh, that the fast research shows the faster moving and the, the traffic and the louder it is, less, pe you know, less people enjoy walking there and the less likely they are. We've got crosswalk crossings that are like 46 meters I just showed you. It's just not possible for someone who's mobility challenged to do it. And so with, with these route finding real world obstructions, we find that someone who is not in a car and can't cross that intersection will end up taking a route that's um, twice as far and takes two and a half times as long because of the hills and the fact that you have to cross Artesia twice. Anyway, these are results. And uh, we made these choices not to care about our seniors. And that's why we're not seeing seniors out on the street like we, we do in Japan. You know, the beach cities are very, um, very old. We're older than Japan on average. But in Japan, you see, um, you see seniors on the streets and you don't see that so much here because we're either in our cars or we're at home. And so... Um, number three, you know, thinking outside of the car box, you know, we can senior mobility solutions are one, you bring the destinations closer um, that you can uh, infill and bring, uh, you know, put, put housing and services and recreation and social, um, social spaces all in the same place. Or mobility lanes, you move stuff closer in time. Uh, mobility lanes are like bike lanes and or transit. We connect nodes. We connect nodes at our destinations with transit. You know that the the, um, the nodes that are farther apart. And the alternative, like we're not doing these things that are proven solutions. Instead, we're like suspending the rules of geometry and physics. We're saying we're going to have tunnels with hyperloop, or we're going to have um, we're going to have electric air taxis. This is, this is Eric Garcetti actually held a press conference to say that LA is going to have air, electric air taxis. Uh, and, and this is, this is vaporware. It doesn't even exist. Uh, the other thing is like people think, oh, well, I'll just pull up my phone and I'll call an Uber as if there are armies of on-demand low-cost drivers that are going to come drive us around and when we are, we're not willing to let them live anywhere near us. Yeah, you know, this is just pie in the sky thinking. They're proven solutions, they work elsewhere. This is what we mean. So infill, closer in space. One, it's illegal in the beach cities because of our height limits. Doesn't have to be though, we can change that. Um, there are actual robo taxis in existence today. They're called electric elevators. Um, and building taller lets us preserve open space, which we all love so much. It's um, the most spatially uh, lowest carbon way to live. And not only that, it's cheaper for both government and residents. You know, keeping a car costs us about $10,000 for, for every car that we keep, right? Uh, AAA has done this. Uh, lots of people, uh, academics have done this study. Governments in Hawaii and Massachusetts said, not only does it cost individuals $10,000 to have a car, but it costs government another $10,000 to provide roads and road repair and stuff like that. And another $5,000 for merchants and stuff to maintain parking lots. So that's $25,000 a year for road, uh, for um, car use, for car dependency. And that's why other nations that have lower GDP than the U.S., are able to have nice things like free college and they have universal health care because they're not giving free parking to cars all the time. Their government serves people instead of cars. And so um, building taller, like mid-rise, is really the cheapest way to build housing if it weren't for so many lawsuits or parking mandates. So uh, like I, I was told to like show you what I mean. And so this is, this is a street in Germany um, that with a new gym um, on the right hand side is a gym for youth and the youth ride bicycles to get um, wherever they need. You see that, that there's mixed use, there are cafes and housing over cafes. You see that the roof, the rooftops of all these apartment buildings, these mid-rise apartment buildings 
they're all a, like a common amenity space. So people can do gardening. Uh, you see gardens, you, you see hangouts, there's a greenhouse because this, this particular one is in Northern Germany, it rains a lot. And speaking of it rains a lot, in the middle there's a bioswale that um, funnels all of the runoff from the roofs and, um, and puts that in the bioswale so that it doesn't flood the streets. Um, and so see, seniors and the young, they can be out and about. And if you need to drive, if you're disabled or you need to carry a lot of stuff, there are, um, cars are a guest and there's a lane for cars, but cars have to go slow. There's a lower speed limit. This is what, um, this is what a slow street or, or, or a living street looks like. And you can have all these amenities and it'll still be cheaper than what we're doing in the beach cities. Um, here's another way. Um, here's another uh, density around a parkway. That's a, a parkway. It's a parkway and a bioswale. Um, and so like everyone can live next to a park if we can just build hot, taller. And here's density around a plaza. So uh, for instance, um, in South Redondo at Riviera Village, Redondo Beach owns the triangle in the middle of Riviera Village, but we use it for parking. We don't use it for our people. And then all around we impose that it can only be one story and it can't be, it can't have housing on top. And um, we can have our parks, we can have our parkways, um, we can have our housing and we can do it for cheaper if we stop, you know, imposing pretty dumb rules. Density around a park. This, this could be Anderson Park this, in North Redondo. This could be Pollywog Park in um, East Manhattan. We would just allow mid-rise apartments around a park so more people can enjoy the open space of a park and we can meet our regional housing needs assessments. And, uh, and like we would have a neighborhood for neighbors instead of a neighborhood that serves for free parking which is what we've got right now. So just imagine better, we can have this and it would be cheaper than the status quo. And so three, uh, so three B is mo mo mobility, moving things closer in time. You know, most of us bicycle faster than we can walk. If we can't bicycle, we can do, use electric micro mobility and there are lots of form factors for every, um, every person. So bike lanes are, don't just serve middle mammals, middle-aged men and lycra, they serve everyone. Bike lanes are mobility lanes. And so I just wanna remind you, safe streets are a feminist issue. Bike lanes are not just for middle-aged men and lycra. Um, Cities should serve people, not cars. This is a Dutch woman um, who is riding a hand bicycle. She, um, she's riding a hand bicycle and it's electric assist. She's got that rack there and she can put in panniers and she can put her shopping in there. And because in um, the Netherlands, they have a lot of bike lanes, she's able to live independently. She's not sitting out there waiting for the Via van to come to her. She just um, can take an elevator downstairs, get on the street and roll to the grocery store or to her office. In this case, she's um, rolling to her office at a university. So car and I'm not saying that I want to ban cars. Cars should be used sparingly and they should serve people. We shouldn't serve cars. And people say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What if you have to schlep kids or something like that? Or what if you have a lot of cargo? Well, this is my friend Kate, who married a guy in the Netherlands. And she rides her electric trike with her two children to school. And then depending on the day, she either rides to the train station to go to her office in Utrecht, or she um, rides home to telecommute. Um, on the top right, that's Olivia de Havilland in her 20s um, riding, a, um, riding in the Warner lot, carrying props um, on the set. Um, and that's her riding a tricycle She's a hundred in this picture. So, you know, like if we were active lifelong, she was riding her, she was riding around to gr get groceries at a hundred, right? And um, on the left is what's called a bike bus. That's where parent chaperones um, bike with children in, in, it's a rolling school bus. This, this one's in Limerick, Ireland. And believe me, it rains a lot. And if it rains so much in Ireland and the kids ride their bicycles to school, we could do that here too. 
And, and this one I think is in Amsterdam, you know, you don't need a SUV to take people, uh, take kids around. This is a uh, father with three children riding, to, um, riding around. Notice they're not wearing helmets. If there aren't cars that could possibly hit them, you don't really need helmets. Um, and then, then um, if you, you can then use bicycles or wheelchairs in conjunction with transit. And trains are really good, much easier than buses to get in and out of. And we'll talk about that later. But uh, my mom used, you know, in Silicon Valley, you know, it may, it, Silicon Valley is not Amsterdam. So what my mom used was a mobility scooter. And a lot of seniors um, in the beach cities and beyond use mobility scooters. And there are different types for all sorts of different uses. See in the bottom left, she has one of a compact ones that you can get around in tight spots. Like if you're going to a doctor's office or you're going to a restaurant or a library, you might want a smaller, lighter one. But if you're going grocery shopping, like the lady in the bottom right, she might have like a bigger one that can go faster and carry more. Or like a me, um, like I like the one in the top left because that's more of an all. Um, that's a very common, uh, medium purpose one, but they can go up to forty five miles on a single charge. In Europe, you'll see at restaurants that people um, restaurants will often bring an extension cord when they see a senior in a mobility scooter. They'll bring out an extension cord so that the um, person using the mobility scooter can plug in and top off their battery before going home. And, and it doesn't, it just requires an extension cord that you get at Home Depot. It doesn't require any um, $40,000 tested charging station. Um, this is San Francisco. Um, this is a bike lane in San Francisco. This yeah, and this is better than anything that we have in the beach cities right now, but this is just rather depressing. The veteran interviewed um, in this photo was interviewed and, and, um, and he shouldn't have to be brave to cross the street once, you know, he lost his ability to walk serving the nation and this is the way we serve, we serve you know, this is the way that we reward him. That's just embarrassing. Um, this is New York. Uh, bike lanes are dual use. In both of these photos, you see bi both bicycles and you see wheelchairs using the bike lane. And they're moving faster than car traffic. This is, um, this is a really sad thing that I've been harping on the cities to do what's called a pedestrian scramble. Like among Manhattan Beach Boulevard between Valley Ardmore West towards Pier, we, um, People that are on card are in the intersection it, uh, it, during a pedestrian scramble cycle. And then when cars are turning, it's a cars only thing. So we separate in time cars and the people outside of cars. But if we, we don't do, if we don't change the signal timing, what, what we end up is having like left turn or right turn people um, conflicting we call it conflict, but it's really threatening the lives of vulnerable road users. Like, like the, you know, imagine these two um, people in a wheelchair are just friends trying to get home from dinner in San Francisco. And this is a signal timing failure, right? But we can change the signal timing to give pedestrian scrambles and separate the uses in the intersection. Um, this is Buffalo. If, um, yeah, you know, I showed you light poles and benches and hydrants in the middle of a um, in the middle of a sidewalk. But here they have um, they have snow. But you and the bike lanes are used by wheelchair users if the sidewalk is unusable. And this is a problem because one paint is not protection, but two bike lanes are legally unidirectional. He's using the bike lane illegally by going the wrong way. So if, if a cop wanted to be nasty, a cop could give him a, a pretty expensive ticket for going the wrong way in a bike lane because sidewalks are bi-directional by law, but um, bike lanes are unidirectional because they're a traffic lane, but for bicycles, they're a traffic lane, just like for cars, it would be like wrong way driving. And, uh, but there, there isn't a safe way for him to cross to the bike lane on the other side of the street where it would be legal. Um, so you can't really blame him for doing the best that he could. 
but you could ticket him if the cop wanted to be nasty. And so like, I just want us to think 3D and think better. This is the Netherlands again, and you'll see that there's, um, that there are apartment buildings on the far side of, there are apartment buildings that are on the far side of the river. And they also, the kids there also attend the school on this, the near side of the river. You see how their townhouses, um, to the left, on the left side, it's all townhouses. And then you see apartments and townhouses on the, um, on the right-hand side near the school. So if schools and parks are um, amenities, like we should, and the, we know that the, um, the school run accounts for 30% of the AM and PM um, peak traffic in Redondo Beach. If kids could uh, just walk or roll to school, then we make all this traffic evaporate. And we know this because in Redondo Beach, the cops, um, the police station is right across the street from the high school. And they said there are like over 200 e-bikes parked at Redondo Union. And, they, and each one of them represents one less car. They already noticed that there's less traffic at Redondo Union High School because the kids are um, getting themselves to school on e-bikes instead of being driven. So um, e-bikes or mobility, micro-mobility makes traffic evaporate, but we have to be thoughtful in how we design for them. And this one's great because it just comes down and it, it uses, and the ramp starts at the gymnasium of the middle school, and then it comes gently down. Um, so, and then transit helps us move between different things. Um, Transit is not that easy to use. And uh, Je Jessica can talk some more about that. But our municipal buses all have wheelchair ramps. But if they're, they can only accommodate one or two wheelchairs, wheelchair users at a time. So if there's already, if you're traveling with a friend and there's already someone, a wheelchair user there, then the two of you can't get on the same bus. Or, um, or if there are already two wheelchair users on there, then you then that bus is it's called a bus bus pass up. So you you just gonna have to wait for the next bus and hope that there's space for it. Uh, um, so these are the allowable wheelchairs. So they could allow four wheel power scooters like the one I showed you earlier. But if, if in that case so there's only room for one. So um, this is actually a very difficult problem. So um, buses aren't as useful for wheelchair users as trains and light rail, because with these rail cars, you can, um, you can travel in groups of wheelchair users, like, um, like that group, uh, that, cu that couple in San Francisco um, coming home from dinner. Um, you can, you can, you and all your friends could like go to the mall and have lunch and go watch a movie and still travel on the same train. And all these seats over here also flip up. So if you have more wheelchair users or bicycles, the, the seats just flip up and, um, and they have an easier loading thing. So if you don't have um, light rail, you, um, we do have shared shuttles and that's the Beach Cities Transit Wave or VIA or Metro Mi Micro. But again, that's only one wheelchair user at a time. And then you, and they're shared and they're roundabout and you have to wait outside for up to 45 minute time window. And it's really not very user friendly. So you can't do spontaneous things like say, tell a friend, hey, you know, the weather's great. Let's go out for lunch. A wheelchair user can't do that in, in the existing system that we have. And so like putting it all together, a master class Sapporo. Um, my dad came to grad school in the US and that's why I grew up in California. My uncle went to grad school and was a professor uh, in Japan. And that's why my cousins grew up in Sapporo. And Sapporo was built after World War II, modeled as a US city. They did a set, they did, it's a planned city planned to be like an American city from the early 20th century. There's a train station and then there's a business district around the train station. Everything's on a straight regular grid, unlike Tokyo or Kyoto. And um, 
they, they built a state university with a medical hospital like UCLA. It also, like UCLA, is very international, has Taiwanese people like my family. My, um, my cousin is a professor there, and her lab, she's got postdocs from Russia, China, um, Germany, the U.S., She's, you know, it's very international, but what they do is they do density plus transit. And in Sapporo, you see so many seniors out. Um, this is, uh, so here's the layout. Here's the train station right here. There's a university. You see lots of green space and mid-rise buildings around green space. Um, this is the train station. It has total transport integration. You get out of the train and then you either go to a subway or you come up for a bus or you take, um, uh, they have electric trams on the surface. And it's, there's a whole, the whole city is connected with underground tunnels. Well, okay, but like density is not a dirty word here. It, this is just an ordinary train station and the mall is at a train station. And do you see this light well on the right-hand side, this Oculus? Like, un, it's like the Oculus we have at Del Amo. It has, um, it lets sunlight in deep, in deep into the mall. And this is what the mall, uh, this is the older part of the mall, but this is actually the tunnel under the street. And so Sapporo has tunnels, but the tunnels move people, not Tesla's going, eight, you know, eight miles an hour. And these tunnels have restaurants in them. So you can have a lunch date in the tunnel. Um, and then after lunch, you take an electric elevator up, which is an on-demand electric um, vehicle then it just takes you up to the roof where there's a public park and you see there's there's somebody uh, there's somebody there um, gardening on a public park on a rooftop and like and people say oh well the beach cities were built out and we can't do that here but we can because i just showed you like we already have like anderson park we are or we already have polywog park we just build housing around them or uh, we could do, build a uh, housing around the plaza at Riviera village we can remodel and connect like downtown manhattan beach and manhattan village mall are two two pretty active nodes that people want well so Imagine if we could travel in a parkway, it, travel in a parkway between the two along the old red line, um, you know, the Valley Ardmore Linear Park. Well, turn that into a parkway, you know, pave it maybe with permeable pavers so that someone could roll a mobility scooter between the two and then fix a few of the problematic intersections. And already we would have a way for someone without a car to access all the services and all the amenities in a safe and pleasant manner between the two activity nodes of Manhattan Beach. You know, this is doable. This is very doable because the city owns this land and con controls its own zoning. So anyway, and then I have a bunch of backup slides, but sorry I took so long. Oh, wait, one more thing. I'm going to share um, so I wanted to show you this is the beach cities at um, this is a this is the bikeways in the beach cities and you notice how the bikeways are in little pockets over by parks and they're disconnected from one another. Remember it's not a network unless they connect. So this is not a network. this is, this is window dressing. This is Utrecht at the same scale. This is, this is a, a compact city center and look how dense and connected the network is. And then if you live in one of the villages over here, one of the smaller villages, you would have a dense network, go to the train station, take a train and you're in the big city in 15, 20 minutes. Um, but we have train stations here, but we don't build housing or a connected network near the train stations. We just build parking lots. Anyway, thank you for listening to me rant and rave. Did I bore you? Did I put everyone to sleep? No, my, my question is, I, 
I've seen how other places work, other countries, but how do we get from where we are now to, to being better? Because it's great to say this is how it could work, but we have, you know, people who are living and owning stuff, whether it's, you know, retail or houses, how do we, how do we start to make that transition? Because it can't happen all at once and it's- No, it can't. But it's, it's interesting because, I mean, it's interesting because the, um, if you read like the Manhattan Beach housing element, it says there's going to be a whole lot of um, housing like at that corner of Manhattan Village. And you know, when they built, when you know, and they said it's all going to be low income housing, right? Like anyone will let that be built. But it starts with showing up at the meetings because we just had we just had torrents say no to a 400 foot bike lane that would connect two sections of Redondo Beach bike lanes um, because they said, oh, well, we, we have local control over our streets and this is just a takeover. So, um, we, and, you know, you have to go there and you have to shout people down. And you also have to enact rules that say that a few loud people can't veto everything for someone else. Because that's what the regional housing needs assessment is, mm -hmm. is because wealthy, because wealthy cities have been vetoing housing for so long, we got into this crisis. And we can't say that we're, well, local, you know, local control, states rights, we get to make our own rules. Um, that doesn't work because then every other city will then point to us and say, well, why do we have to build housing when the charter cities say that they won't? And the charter cities are the older, wider, wealthier cities. You know, we have to be good regional citizens. So, the, big, the big issue I think that's gonna come up is our population is aging far 